Okay, so hi guys, uh, my name is Daniel. Uh, I'm a computer scientist slash full stack backend front end developer, whatever. Uh, working for Adobe for um, almost nine years now. Um, and today I'm going to talk, well, yeah, latest trends in building large web apps that scale, but it's mostly about not how you build the app, but how you organize the code and how do you do the tooling around your, your, your big app. So the secret to building large apps is to never build large apps. Uh, Justin Wire, the author of JavaScript MVC, one of the first MVC frameworks in JavaScript, uh, said that you need to break your applications into small pieces, then assemble those accessible bite-sized pieces into your big application. So what, does, what that means? Uh, let's say we have this large app. I'm not very good at drawing. I'm a developer, but not a CSS developer, if you want. So uh, let's say we have this large app. It has some, uh, has some, some modules, like the home module, users, reports, uh, admin, and so on and so forth. And when you click on one of those tabs, um, you will load uh, the module for the, the specific section, right? So traditionally, you do that uh, using, uh, using WebPack, right? So Webpack offers that, have that awesome code splitting feature. So when you navigate to a specific group in your app, you can load that, that piece of JavaScript and all the assets uh, for that specific module. You can load it on, on runtime, basically, which saves a lot of uh, downloading for, for the user, right? But, uh, and you do this with Webpack in, uh, in Angular, you do it with load children in the router. So you basically say that for that slash user's path, I will dynamically load that module, which contains every JavaScript from now on in that, in that module. And in React, it's uh, pretty similar. You have that React Native component. You define your user's module and what, what, what not, and then you use the route and the component to, to load it. Uh, now, what happens when um, those uh, applications, you already had those applications. They were built by different teams in different technologies. For, for example, React, Angular, and Vue. And you want to create this shell app around, around it. You have, we have that in, in Adobe with the Experience Cloud Platform, where we have different solutions which are quite big. Um, well, and those, th those uh, applications use different modules, right? So for the example, in this example, Vue.js and React uses the Spectrum CSS library. Spectrum CSS is an open source framework for, from Adobe. It's similar to Twitter Bootstrap. We don't have the, the grid layout, but we have all the components uh, in it and we have implementations for React, Angular, and Web Components. And our applications are not static, they are communicating with some servers, so you have a set of microservices between an Nginx reverse proxy, like an SJS application, Node.js application, an Express, which uh, communicates with the, with the database, and so on and so forth. So you have this, this big, this big uh, chunk of, of projects, different projects, libraries, apps, servers, and stuff like that. And the problem with, with this approach, so if you have basically two options, right? You have a different GitHub repo for every project, and that's okay, it's not a problem. But what happens when somebody um, modifies uh, the UI library, for example? When somebody, if you have different GitHub projects, you modify the UI library, you make a new release, you have a new release on NPM, um, then we, you have three applications which have to uh, import that new version of the library, then test if everything is okay, but the applications have different release cycles in it. So you'll end up, uh, I don't know, making the button from blue to red, and you have the button blue here because uh, this, was, this one was updated first, and then the other ones will still have the button red, for example, because they also need to test. So you'll have discrepancies in your, in your UI in that large application. Uh, the, the idea here is to use a monorepo. Uh, big companies use that. Um, the, the advantage of a monorepo is that you have all projects, all libraries, servers, front-end applications, and everything in it. You have all of them in one GitHub repo. And when somebody updates something, it will be available for every other application in that, in that monorepo. The problem with the monorepo is that if you have lots of applications that have unit testing, end-to-end -end testing, and all of, all of all, all sorts of testing in it, when you co when you do a commit in that GitHub repo and everything get, goes into your CI/CD pipeline, the test uh, will and the build time will take uh, longer because you have different applications that need to be built and well compiled and stuff like that. So the idea is to have a system in place that knows when you modify something, which other applications are impacted by that change, right? So if you modify the UI library, your UI library is only used in the Angular and React app, you'll only need to 
do the building and the testing only for the affected part of your of your monitor, all right? So then you have everything working uh, very, very cool. For that, we use um, Enix Workspace. It's a tool developed by uh, Narwhal Technologies, which is a company of Victor Safkin. V Victor Safkin was uh, part of the Angular team and worked on the Angular router, so he knows his, uh, his game. Um, what, Workspace, what Enix uh, brings us is that the support for detecting uh, what changed and what you need to, to test. And we, got, we get out of the box support for TypeScript, we get support for Webpack, uh, ESLint, Prettier, uh, just with just a snap, just snapshot testing for our unit testing, uh, Cypress for the end-to-end -end testing part, and TypeDoc for uh, documentation. If you have a library, you can generate automatically can generate documentation from your uh, code comments, right? Um, <clears throat> we also use here Striker, which is a mutation testing framework. But I forgot to put that on the slide. Uh, do you know, guys, what the mutation testing is? So mutation testing is, um, is a tool that um, basically randomly modifies your source code. So you have a class in TypeScript, then you have a test for that class. Uh, you run mutation testing on it. What, what it basically does, you randomly mutate the, the class code. So if you have a method that returns something, it'll return null. If you have a loop for zero, from 0 to 5, you'll change it from 0 to 3. And for every mutation, you'll run your tests that affect that class. And if the tests are not failing, it means that you're not testing the right thing. If you change the code, the tests should fail. So we, we had a project that it was like 90% code coverage. We introduced mutation testing, and the coverage dropped to 63%. So that was a, that was a big surprise for us. So once you have all these packages, what's, the, what's our, uh, our pipeline? So the CI-CD pipeline is the code goes into GitHub in a PR. The Jenkins CI-CD pipeline picks up that PR, tests everything, it's everything, it's OK. We create some Docker images for every application, for every server, stuff like that. And everything is deployed using Kubernetes on AWS AKS. So that's like our, um, our setup right now. Um, I want to write some code, with, but it's similar to what, what I uh, said earlier. So I will create um, a server. I will create a React application, an Angular application that uses that API that I'll build. And then I will also create some libraries shared between the, between the, the projects. So you'll see how, how commits can, can change everything and show you the, like, the dependency graph of, uh, of everything. So, <clears throat> with that being said, I will get started. So, uh, just there you go. Okay. So, in order to, to create uh, an NX workspace, you need to install an NX uh, CLI. You are not able to see my screen. Where's the screen? Just a second. There you go. Okay. So, you need to uh, install the, the NX CLI, and then. Um, you do something like this, so npx uh, create NX workspace latest version in the name of my, my workspace. I'm gonna, not going to do this now because it takes quite a time. So I already created uh, my uh, workspace, it's here. And if I load that into an IDE, you see the project structure. So you have uh, an apps folder that is uh, empty right now. You have the this folder where everything will get built, um, a libs folder, and some tooling. We, we don't need to talk about that. Is basically you can write some custom scripts to generate stuff, but I, I will show you that. And I will also get out of the box uh, support for Prettier, um, ESLint, and everything everything that you need to, to do basically. So uh, let's start by creating the server. Right? I will uh, I will add capabilities to my workspace to create Nest application. Nest it's a very cool. Uh, framework. Uh, it's similar to Angular, but on the server side, it's it, it's an awesome framework. I really love it. Yeah. The font. Just on there. Let's see. It's working my turn. Or not. Oh, I just killed my terminal. So just. Sorry. <laughs> I don't think it was the command plus. It does not quit option, but. Okay, let's increase the font from here, just to be sure. Profiles, text, to 20. 
better? Okay. Um, so now, what did I do? So add the nest capabilities to my app, right? And now I can create nest application. So in order to do that, you have that NX that I told you generate. I want to create a nest application and the name will be API. This will use in the default folder. And this will use the schematics that Enix has to create a new application and set up everything for me, like Webpack, uh, unit testing, end-to-end -end testing, everything. So this will take uh, not very long, I hope. There you go. Okay. And now, if I go to my apps folder, I have an API app just is already configured for unit testing and coverage and everything you want. And here you have the application. So this is basically the bootstrap part of the application. Just creates like a, it's built on top of, of Express. So on a global prefix on slash API, I'll have some some stuff, and then I'll have a I have a module. Like I said, it's similar to Angular, so you can re recognize the syntax from there. I have the app controller, the app service. The app controller basically tells me that when I do a get, it'll call this method that calls this service that returns something like welcome to the API. So if I go here. Oh, sorry. I need to, first I need to add another dependency, which is Webpack Merge. It's a bug in the latest version of Enix. You don't really need to do that, usually. Okay, and now I use Enix Serve, and my application name is API. And now we'll open up the server on <coughs> this port, slash API. I can see, welcome to the API. Live reload is in place, so if I go here and Modify the code and save the file. Refresh. Everything is updated. There. Okay. <clears throat> now uh, I need to create in this app service. I want to have some uh, some um, hard coded data, right? So I created to dos, which is a map, and the key is a number, and I can put a in it. Okay. And now. In the constructor, I'll add something to that map. This to do dot set zero, and I have an object that it has an ID and it has like a title. I don't know, do something. Okay, and let's just uh, create another one. Okay, and the ID is one. <coughs> I want to do something else. Come on, there you go. Okay, I'll create a method in the service, like get to do, so return an array, array of any. You could create an interface for this, but I'll show you some magic later. Uh, return this to do's values. And I, we need that as an array, so array from this. Okay, there. And I need to go to my controller and create a new method here. So whenever I, um, not this one, whenever I go to slash happy slash to do's, I'll have this get to do's method that returns an array of any that returns this app service get to this. Awesome. Now, if I go to the browser and slash to do's, I get the Intel server error. Awesome. Let's see what happened here. Array is not defined because this is a special kind of array. Just two pairs. Okay. There you go. Okay, so I have this. Now we need an Angular application and a React application to use this API, right? So in order to create the React application, you do a uh, yarn add the at an uh, react react there you go. Now we'll add capabilities to create React applications to my workspace. It's installing some stuff. Okay, and now I can generate my React. React app with the name, let's call it items app. Um, I want the styling to be a CSS. Um, I want to use class components 
don't throw stuff at me because of hooks. Uh, and I think that's all, yeah. I don't want routing for the application, it's just a simple app. And if I go in my workspace, I have the <coughs> items app and I have an items app E2E. This is the end-to-end -end testing. It's another application with, uh, built with Cypress that is gonna test my app. So if I go here, I can see that I have uh, a page object that selects my each one from the page. And um, I have an app spec that basically goes to uh, my application and then checks if the, that H1 is, contains that text, that everything it is. Okay, and the items app, it's a React application that we're, uh, with TypeScript, just enabled, everything it's enabled. I need to comment this, because I'll, I'll override, override it later. And here I have the styles, the spec for the component and the actual component. Now, if I go here and to NX serve uh, items app. I still have the server running on this other screen, right? Okay, it will start up the React application on this port, so localhost for And I have a React application, with also with live reload, live reload in place. So if I go here and delete the stuff and write some just, I don't know, items, app, live reload is in place. You can see the, the app here. Okay, so now let's try and get some data from the server, right? Now, because I'm using TypeScript, I need to declare an interface for my component state. Let's call it app state. And it'll have a to do's list. And from the server, we'll get an array of any. And now we get this is the interface for our application props. I don't need everything, anything custom there, so I'll just leave it blank. And now in my constructor, I'll get some properties that I need to pass them to the parent component. And let's just initialize our state. Oops, sorry. With to do list, empty array. Props. Thank you, ID. Okay. Uh, now, whenever I mount the component, we need to fetch the data from the server, right? So I'll do this in a sync because it's just way better. And now I'll have the response. We'll use fetch for it. So await fetch slash API slash to do's. And then we have the data, which is await response.json. Okay, this set state to do's list my data object. Awesome, and now to paint everything on the screen, not that one. Oh, my bad. Let's put a fragment here. There you go, now. Okay, and we will iterate for our to-do's list, this state dot to-do's list dot map. I add it an item, we need the index for the key, and we will paint some, um, there you go, we we'll have, sorry, we have item that, the name was title, I think, and the key is my index. Awesome, now, nothing happens. Why is that? Because slash API slash to do's is not a valid path. So we don't have this path here, we have it in the server. What can you do with NX Workspace is you can create a proxy for your app. So I'll just create here a file called proxy.conf.json, which tells us that whenever we go to the API on this server, we will redirect everything to our actual server. Okay, and in order to use this proxy config file, you need to go here to workspace JSON under your app. This is basically tells us how the application is built, where Webpack is running, you can override everything <coughs> from there. So I need to go here to the surf part and tell it that my proxy config that Webpack dev server will use is located in apps 
uh, items app slash proxy.com.json and whenever you're changing stuff here you need to restart the react application and now if the demo gods are here with us today there you go we have data from the server if you don't believe me we can go to the server and do something else for sure save refresh the page we have the text here okay now um, we need to create an angular application that does the exact same thing right so we'll create we need to add um, angular capabilities angular any minutes now okay and we need to generate uh, an angular application so angular app the name will be admin let's say let's say that we want to manage the, those items at some point i don't know and we also use a css for routing just because i like it and we can actually use another cool thing here backend project what this does is automatically generates the proxy config for, for you based on the settings for my backend project so i don't have to do it manually so my backend project is api and now i generate the application uh, no no routing There you go. And now I have an admin, an admin app E2E, so the same thing as for the React application, another suit test and to testing for the, uh, the Angular part. But as you can see, I have the proxy config JSON here, and it's already configured to work with the API. If the API was using port 7, you'll update with port 7 here, so it's, everything is awesome like in that Lego movie. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so now we need to change the port for this one because the default port will also be f uh, for 200. So we need to go here to admin app and under serve, we need to change the port that is running. Uh, let's change it to Okay, and now let's enix serve my admin app. Angular takes longer to compile. But I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Angular fan, so I'm not saying it in a, in a bad way. Okay. So, almost <coughs> 100, and this is my Angular application. Okay. Now, everything is also in place for this, like live reload testing and everything else. Actually, I can, I can actually show you the tests. So, I can run Enix test my admin app, for example. And, oh, sorry with code coverage, there you go. And we'll run any test that you'll find in that application and then generate this awesome coverage directory in apps, admin app. I can actually open this in a browser and you can see the code coverage for the, for the application. So this is the HTML and this is the actual class component. Okay, now. Going back, uh, we need to get rid of the styles and get rid of everything in here. We'll say like this is the admin app. Okay, and now I need to get data from the server, right? I can go ahead and create a service here, but Enix can do that for me. So Enix generate Angular. I need a service. And uh, the project is admin app because I can have multiple Angular pro projects. And the name for it will be to do's. Ooh. Now I have two classes here, the test file for the service and the actual service, right? Now I need to fetch data from the server. So in Angular, you need to go here and import your HTTP client module. And since I'm here, I also set the provider for my service. And now in the service, I need to inject the HTTP, HTTP client, and create a get to do's to do's method that will return an observable with an array of any. And now return this HTTP get. This needs to be cast because.
of TypeScript, slash happy slash to do's. And in my component here, I can get rid of this. I'll have a to do's list that is uh, not observable because I'll use a sync, async for that, any stuff. And now in the constructor, I can import my to do's service service and this to do's list it's this to do's service get to do's and now in the template create a similar list ng4 not this one ng4 there you go uh, let item of to do's list which is async <coughs> and put everything in here title there you go now, we have everything working in two applications. One is React, one is Angular, and this is my server, which is awesome. Now, if, we can see, if you want to see the dependency, the dependency tree of your, uh, of your workspace, Enix has a command for that, is dep deprecated uh, graph. It's called, you know, load up the page in uh, Chrome. So I have this items app that it's, it's, a, it's a dependency for the items E2E, admin app, and API. As you can see, both applications are using the API, but there's no link between them because the workspace doesn't know that you're actually calling an endpoint. It's too much of a hassle for it. So because of that, anybody can now go into the API and they can change something without testing. Let's say they do this. Now, because there's nothing in place that will tell me that I will break other applications. Now, if I go ahead and refresh this page, I don't have the first message here because the, it was expecting title and not message. So let's fix that. <coughs> uh, let's change this. In order to fix that, I'll create the library in my workspace. So I'll generate a workspace library uh, called, let's say, data model. And this is just a simple TypeScript library with nothing in it, basically. So in my libs folder here, I'll have a data model library uh, this one, sorry. There you go. And I will export an interface that I was talking about earlier to do item. And I know that this has an ID, which is a number, and it has a title, which is a string. Okay. Now, I need to go into my API application and use this awesome library of mine. So instead of any, I will say that it's to do model. It knows that it's from that, that library and it's imported like this. Right? So this can be deployed in NPM registry or whatever and then just use that library as it is. And because I did that, I need to change everything in here to be to do item. And also I need to go into admin app, into my service, and now this is a to do item array. And in my component as well here. Okay. And the same for the React application. Don't mind the errors, it's uh, from the ID, it's, it's slow. Okay, and in my state here, now I have to do it. So now everything works, uh, you, need to, you need to restart the applications because I, sometimes, because I just added a new library and it gets confused about the local file system, but okay. And now everything works as expected. Uh, if we go to the dependency graph, you can see that Enix now work knows that I've imported that library in my project and is able to know that if I change something in data model, the changes will be reflected in the API, the admin app, and the items app. So now if I go here, and because I'm using a, a library, what you do when you want to change this title, basically, you need to go to the interface and refactor this into, let's say, message. And once you do that, everything is still working because if you look at the code, uh, if I, ch I change this here, so if I go to the admin service, I can see that now everything was changed to message. If I go to the Angular application, this was changed to message. And also if I go to the items app, I can see that this is, was changed to message. And uh, apart from this, I also get a cool code completion that I know what's, what actually will come from the server, which is great. And nobody can break this for me. Well, unless if I go here, right, right. Okay. 
Um, now, um, those item renderers, if you want to call them like that way, uh, look the same. So let's create an, another library because we don't like duplicate, the duplication of code, right? So NW workspace, I'll create another library, which should be called UI. Okay, and this, and I also need to uh, add, because I'll create the library using web components, so let's just add lit element, because it's way faster. There you go. And now if I go to the UI, library, which is here. Come on, come on, come on. Okay, I can export, export a new class. Let's call it lit, uh, list, list, uh, list item, which stands uh, lit element. And the name for my awesome custom component will be, custom element will be, let's say, list item. <coughs> Okay, and we need the uh, property so anybody else from the outside can write values in my uh, in my components, and I'll have a render. It's similar to React. This list, list, list component framework, but it is pretty cool. I return HTML, HTML, which we need to import from here. There you go. Okay, and here I will just render a list item. Uh, with a class, let's call it item, list item, list item, and because this is the string interpolation for me, it's ES6, okay, and also let's add some styles to our components, so we have a get static style, uh, get styles, there you go, return some CSS, come on, import, and this CSS will be for the item list class that I've just defined. Let's say we have a list style none. We want to get rid of those bullets. Font style, let's do italic just to be able to see it. And we also add a color, but using CSS global variables which are supported right now, which is awesome item color, and the default value will be red if nobody sets that variable for us. Okay, now I just need to go ahead in my apps and refactor the templates. So here I need to change this to a list item. And this goes away because if you have a value, sorry, this is Angular binding. You have a value property that is item.message. And because we're in Angular, you need to go into App Module and add a new schema. Because that's not an Angular component. So, Custom Element Schema. Here we go. We go ahead and... Well, usually you need to rest re restart the application, but... Yeah, you need to restart the application. Uh, oh, sorry. Just forgot to import my library. So, we need to import the library. This is the name of the old library. And I need to just start it. And we need to go here. And I have this. What? Sorry. It is item. or I just misspelled something. Yeah, so the library is here. You can see this is a list, a list item which has a shadow DOM and everything. It's a web component library. Um, the problem is, pro I, I think I misspelled the, um, just a second, item list. Yeah, list item. Right? That's why the styles weren't there. There you go. Okay. And now we need to use this library in React application as well. So go to the items app and update this to be list item. And it has a value which is item.message. And restart the application, of course. Oh, and also. I always forgot this. 
import the damn library. And it's lab slash UI. There you go. OK, and remember that I uh, added that support for uh, overwriting um, CSS styles. I have this item color, global CSS global variable. If I go into the Angular app in styles, I can see that for every element that is of type list item, um, this item color will be blue, for example. And now this is blue, this is red, which is awesome. Now, uh, I, I need to go ahead and commit this to show you the greatest thing about Enix. And, and I'm done, basically. Uh, okay, commit. Now, if we go ahead and look our, at our dependency graph here, you can see that, okay, API, admin app, and items app uses the data model library, and admin app and items app uses the UI library. So, in theory, if anybody changes some code in the UI library, we need to run the tests only for the library and the apps affected without running the tests for the data model and the server, right? That's the, the promise of, of Enix. So I go ahead and change this default property into orange, for example. Now, if I go here, everything works. This is blue and this is orange. So everything is nice. But if in order to know what I need to to test, I can use affected dependency graph, for example. And Enix will tell me and will tell the CI, sorry, 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 sorry. I've compared this branch with my master branch base head. There you go. Sorry. Now, <coughs> it's, it's so that I've chosen to come to the UI library, it will tell me that, okay, you need to run the tests only for those libraries. And how do you do that is your command in the CI system should be in order you should be in order of doing uh, npm test, you'll do nx affected test, for example, and you'll run the test only for those libraries. So, ah, forgot the base parameter, base head. And run the test only for UI, items app, and admin app. And run the test for that. Some tests are failing because I've changed the code and not updating the test, but. So fail projects for those, you can run it with only failed. You can also run, I don't know, stuff like that. Uh, API watch, for example, and you have a watcher. So I need to run all the tests and anytime I change a test, this will run automatically and everything else. So you, you get everything out of the box and also the end-to-end -end tests, which are uh, run something like this. Items app E2E and E to E, and I need to stop the items app because the port is used. And this will open up Cypress, open up, build the application, uh, serve the application on that specific port, and then open up Cypress and run the test, which will fail because I don't have that message in, in the header. So there you go, Cypress. And I will fail because this contains items app so I have one failed spec. Uh, I also get a uh, failed PNG, which is located somewhere, uh, I think here. Items app, E2E, you know, in this, 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 here you go. Apps, Cypress, Cy Cypress apps, there you go. So I have a screenshot here. So I can see the screenshot, what happened. I can also do video recording for tests and everything else. So that's about it. Um, there are some resources here with everything that I've talked about. If you have any questions, anybody? Yep, go ahead. Okay, so uh, early on this presentation, you talked about the uh, mutation test, and I want to know how uh, difficult or easy is for you and your team to Right, the different kind of tests, or, or the well, in uh, in Adobe, we don't have a QE team anymore for almost two years now. So uh, any developer is responsible <coughs> to write the spec for a feature, write the code, and write the test for it. And the coverage should be 90%. If the coverage is not 90%, the PR is not accepted. So it's basically it didn't work. Right. So 
You need to write unit tests and the end <laughs> tests and be responsible for the whole feature until production. So it's kind of enforced. We don't do TDD, so we write the code first, see that everything it works, works, and then write the test for it. That's what we do, basically. But we need to make sure that the coverage is pretty high because not having a QE team quite be, can be quite difficult when trying to release something and test it. So that's why we need to rely on automation for everything. Okay. Yep. How many Rich API changes to Facebook from because I can imagine this changes a lot in like React version, a lot of major version changes. How do you handle it? Oh, you mean when the tooling updates? Yeah, any of yeah, them. Angular, the, they have schematics. If the Angular updates, so we can update the code using that. React has also some stuff that you can automatically migrate the code. And Enix Workspace, they don't have, they have some schematics, but they usually just the release notes and you need to maintain them. Until now, it wasn't that difficult. Maybe we lost at some point like a few days, but it's from the advantage that you get using it, it's, it's okay. It's very configurable, so if, you, if, if something changes and you, you're not actually not able to, um, sorry, to, to fix it, or you don't have a fix for it, you can fix it yourself uh, in this workspace JSON, you can also put like a, you can put like a custom Webpack config. It's basically just a JS file that supports a function, and the function will get the Webpack context that it's already built. You can override stuff in it and just return it, and it will use that for you. So it's not like create React app where you need to eject and then you stay with it ejected. You can actually use it while they, uh, without leaving the, the DNX workspace, which is great for us. Yeah. The requirement to use React with uh, TypeScript, or no, no, you can. I think there, there's a parameter that you can generate JavaScript React for you. It's not. Uh, we usually use React because big teams across the globe, it's easier to maintain the code. If you have a library that I don't know has two parameters and you don't know the type of, it, of them, it's quite hard to. It's easy to introduce breaking changes. If you have an interface for that. It's well, easier. And also, because we are full stack guys, we have people coming from Java. TypeScript is way easier to understand <laughs> than JavaScript. Yeah. So, uh, what's the difference between the Angular Framework and the React Framework? Like, what's the difference between the React and the React Framework? We have a unified shell project that is just the header and loads your applications in an iframe, and it has an API using post message, which you can use to communicate with it. So every solution, uh, Adobe Analytics is in an iframe, Adobe Target is in an iframe, and the Unify Shell is just an app for the, that experience, basically. I thought about that uh, because we actually need that now. Um, the only option is to use uh, something that built to generate TypeScript interfaces out of your Java classes. You could use that. We we have we don't have a POC for it yet. So no out of the box. No out of the box. No. They have support for Nest, Next, React, Angular. Uh, no view support for now. But you have that schematics. So this basically you can write lots of stuff. You can generate a schematic using Enix and do whatever you want in it. So you could have, talk, you can basically generate a Java project, a Maven project from that, but haven't tested it. Okay. Any other questions afterwards? Okay, thank you. Thank you for your games. If people want to grab food, one more.